Bradley Caristia. I'm a senior architect with JB Hunt Transportation, one of the largest transportation and logistics companies in the country. And tonight we're going to be talking about the inject function. Uh, prior to the inject function, dependencies had to be injected through the constructor. By utilizing the inject function, you can now pull dependencies directly from the dependency injection container at any point, assuming that you're in an injection context. That seems like an excellent ability to have at first glance, but it actually has some significant implications regarding test isolation. For example, as a globally imported function, the inject function is very difficult to mock in tests. Also, because it's how you in access the injection container in the first place, an injectable wrapper for it can't be created. Of course, you could configure testbed to have the inject function return mocks, but that brings along its own set of problems. For more information on the importance of isolation and the impact the testbed can have on it, you can watch my talk from last year's lightning talk, Lollapalooza. So ideally, the answer is to not use the inject function at all. Given that the inject function is being used, though, a natural question would be when, or perhaps more accurately, where, should it be called? The benefits of the existing pattern of constructor injection will provide some objective criteria to compare each of the available options against. Constructor injection is so named because all dependencies are provided through the constructor, which means that all of them are co-located, so it's easy to tell at a glance what a class depends on. It's easy to mock because you just pass the stubs as arguments to the constructor, and if you miss a dependency, it'll cause an immediate compile time error, as all parameters must be provided for it to compile at all. A popular pattern for using the inject function, one that I've seen in quite a few demos, looks like this. In this example, dependencies are declared as fields that are assigned to the result of the inject function. Appropriately enough, it's called field injection. There are a couple of issues with this approach, though. The inject function is always called, so a new replacement has to be created for it. It's easy to forget to assign a field in a test, leading to cannot read x of undefined errors. And the fields could become private, meaning that even more awkward methods like string indexing have to be used in order to access or reassign them. Excuse me. Also possible something like this. I don't actually have a name for this one, so I'm going with arbitrary injection. Now instead of having fields to reassign, dependencies are stuffed into local function variables that are impossible to override in tests. Not only that, but they're scattered around the file, so it's impossible to easily tell everything that a class depends on at a glance. The only way to achieve test isolation with this pattern is to build an inject mock that emulates the real function, which is both complicated and kind of defeats the point of avoiding testbed in the first place. A more palatable solution would be something like this. In this pattern, dependencies are passed as parameters to the functions that use them. And as you might have guessed, it's called parameter injection. That's quite a bit better, since the parameters have to be included in order for the method call to compile, and it didn't use inject at all. At least, not in this class. This pattern just shuffles the problem of injection up to the parent class. The other problem is that this, this code isn't necessarily dry. If multiple functions have, in the same class have the same dependency, the parameter has to be copy-pasted into each one. However, that style could, apart from the requirement to be run in an injection context, actually look like this. As it turns out, this pattern ends up being really useful when it comes to standalone guards and interceptors. Notice that the injection parameters have a default value that uses the inject function. That means that tests can still provide a stub value for that parameter, but real code can just ignore it and let the injection dependency container take over. It still has the problem of parameter duplication, of course, but remember that constructors are just functions. They even intrinsically run in an injection context. Functions with a special name, to be sure, but still just a function. That means that their parameters can have default values too. It's just not something that we're used to doing in Angular. So now constructor injection could look like this. In this approach, tests still don't have to use testbed. In fact, they look exactly the same as they did before. There is one drawback, namely that you could forget to provide a parameter and end up calling inject again. However, if you don't have testbed configured, that would fail immediately and with a clear error message. Using the inject method could become necessary if TypeScript drops support for parameter decorators, as the current ECMAScript standard for decorators does not yet include them. That's because an inject decorator is implied during Angular's constructor injection, not to mention the potential need for the optional skip cell for other decorators. If that happens, or if your project just happens to prefer to the inject function over the existing decorators, the correct way to maintain test isolation will be to use constructor injection and manually instantiate the system under test, just like it is today. Only now, use default parameters to allow the class's constructor to be injected from the dependencies injection container when running outside of a test. Thank you very much.